Eva, which is a consultancy firm owned by the BBA Bank. I work as a data scientist and IoT researcher. And I encourage you to search out, to check out our research lab where we have a lot of open source projects. I'm also a Python enthusiast. I also use it at work and both of these, I'm just an average guy. I also want to thank you, the organization, for accepting this talk and my company for allowing me to, to show uh, some this, this book, this proof of concept. Okay, this is how I'm going to structure the talk. First of all, I want to talk uh, about what is eye tracking, why to use it, in which cases, and how to perform eye tracking. Then I'm going to show you how I build a data set, the models I trained uh, to do the eye tracking. Uh, how I productivize, to, to productivize it in user interactions and the lessons I learned from all these projects. Let's start. What is eye tracking? Well, eye tracking is the process of measuring either the point of gaze, where a person is looking at the screen, or the motion of the eye relative to the head. If I'm looking to the left, to the right, to the top, to the bottom, whatever. So, basically, I want to know where, the, where a user is looking at a specific point in the screen from... from from this image. Why is it useful? Because in neuromarketing and user experience design, you can design uh, heat maps to know which parts of an image is the user looking at. Uh, here, uh, we have a baseball player, and there are differences between men and women. There are also more differences, but I censored it, so you want to know more, please check out the source. It's also used in user interfaces, uh, for example, to help disabled people to control uh, technological devices. And it's also used in uh, virtual reality. It's uh, very interesting, uh, the use case of foveated rendering, which is to, as you can see, to blur all the image but where you are looking, which gives you a realistic experience uh, similar to the, to the real world. It's also used uh, to detect eye contact when you look, for example, to a character in a virtual environment, and he, he's likely to interact with you. And I've seen some examples of targeting uh, where you can like, have a super power in the video game, and you can target a, an object with your eyes and then fire to it. So how is eye, track, eye tracking performed? If you want to do it uh, seriously, you want to be professional in this way, uh, it's better to use a specific hardware. It gives you the, the best results. Uh, you have to, to buy some hardware. Uh, I think the, the latest one is this one. It's like a frame, a glasses frame, where you have two, two cameras pointing at your eyes, and then you have a camera in the middle, so you can see the eyes and what the user is looking in real time. The problem is that the, these devices are expensive, are intrusive, and are not comfortable. Uh, and you can also perform uh, eye tracking with generic hardware, for example, a webcam which is uh, quite affordable hardware. It's comfortable because you don't have to wear it on, but the problem is not very accurate. Uh, here in the yellow square, you can see eye tracking performed with a, with a webcam. <clears throat> so this leads me to, to the question. Can I build an eye tracking system uh, where I use a webcam to detect where the user is looking at the screen? Why to use a webcam? It's inexpensive, it's not intrusive. Everyone has a webcam. And I also would like to, to test uh, deep learning capabilities. In this case, uh, I take the image of the user and I use uh, deep learning models, for example, a neural, artificial neural network as an universal approximator. So I have a regression problem. I have an image and I have to, uh, to guess uh, the point in the screen. And just to stop it and to give this talk. So this is my, my project roadmap. First of all, I had an analysis, which I have already performed. Uh, then I need a data set. Uh, then I need to, to guess what are the meaningful features of that data set. Then I perform some data augmentation to train my models. And then I perform the, the user interaction. First of all, uh, if I want to train a model, I need a lot of images, a label, labeled images of people looking at a specific point, And I have to know what the point uh, is looking at the screen. How did I solve it? Well. This is the proof of concept. Uh, I have people looking at the screen, and the red dot is the point where they are looking at. The idea is, is good, good enough, but there are some, some issues. Uh, the eyes are the fastest, have the, mus the fastest muscles we have in the body. So for example, 
it is possible to have a blink in the photograph. It happens to everybody. Or we also have the saccade movement, which is a movement in which we move the eyes very, very fast. These two examples are examples of this. Uh, and also have the constraints of the problem, which are the, which are the, the image where I want to detect the, the position, where is the camera located, and the image I can take, because not all the webcams have the same resolution. So to generate this kind of data set, I build a game. You are seeing an actual picture of the game. I build it with a pie game. And you have 60 seconds to shoot these targets. Uh, I had to challenge the user in some way, so I have a score. I give you the score after playing the game. And to solve, for, for example, the, the saccad movements, uh, I added some, some kind of, of tricks to the game. There is a win that drags the mouse uh, over the time. Uh, the positions of the targets are random. And when you hit one target, uh, the cursor uh, appears in a random position. And there are also fake delays. So for example, when you hit a target, the target does not, does not disappear immediately. It forces you to, to think, oh, what's happening? I'm, really, I'm actually clicking on the target, so you focus even more on the target. This led me to have a very, a very a more, more resolution in, in the photos. Uh, so now I have the game. Now I have the idea. How, I, how do I approach to people and say, hey, play the game because I want pictures of your eyes? If I say that, people will say, back off, you wait, man. So how do you convince people to actually generate a data set for you and, and, and make them willing to play to get even more data? So this comes gamification into, it comes gamification into, into, into this project. So you have to offer people something in return for playing this game. For example, uh, you give them a score and you gamify, you gamify this game, for example, uh, giving them a hall of records so they can challenge between the users, between them, and say, oh, I'm a very good player or I'm a very bad player. I also made the game a little bit uh, difficult, the, the, first, the, first, the first game you play. So you have a really low uh, score. And you say, oh, how can I suck so much? Then you play another one time. So I give the double examples. And also, I, I found out uh, that if you explain the people what are you trying to do, they are more able, so they're willing to collaborate uh, just to trust in them. We have this kind of feelings, the humans. Uh, so I left a computer with the game installed. And over a week in my company, they, there were 146 uh, games played. And I could gather uh, 3,000 examples. It's actually, they're, they're, these are actually images of people playing the game. You can see they are enjoying it. Maybe they are saying, oh, how bad you are. <laughs> so once I get the, the images, I proceeded to create a meaningful data set uh, to train the model. So I used the library called uh, Delib with uh, this facial model that gives you 68 uh, faci facial points. Uh, it can process like a thousand faces per second, but the problem is that you have to give it first the, the bounding box of the face, which is in fact the, the slowest part. Once I have these facial points, I proceed to extract uh, images of the eyes from the left and from the right eye, which are uh, scaled to 32 by 42 pixels. And then from that 3,000 samples, I, I proceed to perform a data augmentation. I mean, when you're training a, a deep learning model, uh, this is the original sample, and you can perform uh, some, you can create some synthetic data. If you attended to the talk yesterday by the people from Rosen, the only problem is you have to keep uh, the statistical invariances of that data. Here, in this case, the statistical invariance is where the people are looking at. So I cannot perform uh, zooming, uh, rotations, or trilations in the eyes. But I can perform uh, this kind of operations. For example, I can blur the image, so the image is different. I can perform Gaussian noise. I can add salt and pepper. Salt and pepper are adding uh, random, random white and, and black noise. And then I can mirror the images. The problem with mirroring the images is I, that I have to change I have to reverse the X label. I realize it's too, too late, so I have to perform it <laughs> again. 
uh, interesting fact about this is that you have five transformations, but you can combine them. So you have uh, two to the fifth power. So you, can, you are actually multiplying by a factor of 32. So from 3,000 images, I can get uh, 90,000 examples, which is a very good uh, number. Uh, then I scale uh, the data. So right now, we have our original sample, our data maintained uh, samples, and these facial points. That's, these are gonna be the, the inputs of our, of our models. I tried a, a lot of models with a lot of parameters. We can talk about this in the QI if you want. But just to sum it up, these are the, the three more meaningful. The first one is my baseline model. It's, uh, whoops. it's a three-layer model. And in the last layer, uh, it's a linear uh, layer which, which outputs the, the X and Y labels. And here are the, the features I input into the model. This was my first, uh, my, my baseline model, as I've said. The validation loss is pretty nice. Well, I have to explain what is this. If you take the computer of the screen, the data is normalized as the center of the, of the screen is the zero and, the, and the, the, the borders are one minus one, one and minus one. So here you have an accuracy of a circle of a fifth of the screen. So you multiply by two, you have a circle that it is uh, 0.4, which is not very bad. Here in the twin model, I try to predict uh, meaningful features for the left and right uh, images and then the features. You can see that the validation loss is worse than the baseline. The parameters are high and it usually happens. I, I thought I didn't have enough data to train this, this kind of complex model. And then uh, I tried a convolutional uh, network model. Uh, I used two convolutional layers on each, uh, on each eye, uh, having uh, 32 filters or characteristics, then 64, and the kernel is three by three, and the strides of two. I was inspired by the LENET uh, project by Jan LeCun. Uh, the validation loss, you can see it's uh, better, it's the best one. And also I like it that the params are lower than the baseline model. So if you have a better, a better validation loss and lower params, you should go for, for this model. Then, once I have this model, I would like to, to productivize it. How do I use it to perform real eye tracking and to create a product that the user can use his eyes to move a cursor in the, in the screen? Well, the first user interaction I tried was to just to move the, the cursor at the screen. So it's quite uh, useless because you cannot perform anything with that. You, can, you are just moving the cursor. But it's, it is the best way to, to test the real power of, of the model. There is a very strange thing that happens and that is that you are looking at a point in the screen, but you want to know where the cursor is. So if it, if it is not in the same place, you move your eyes to the cursor, then the cursor moves again, and it, it really tricks you. So it's not usable, it, there's not a use, and it tricks the user. So it's only to, to see the, the, the power of the, of the model. Then, well, when, once I found out uh, which was the, the best model, because remember here, we have the, the best validation loss, and this is a little bit worse. I talked uh, lately about this. Once I am satisfied with the model I have, cho I've choose, I've chosen, uh, then I interact in another way. I don't have to be precise uh, in the way I detect the, the gaze of the user. So I created this kind of interaction in which you have infinite scroll. Here, uh, you don't need to know if the cursor is here or here or here. You have to know that it's inside the box. And it happens the same in the scroll down part. So you can perform actual scrolling uh, in a very simple way. Uh, I did this interaction as a request from a friend who is a guitar player and wanted to play partitures or music songs without having to, to change pages manually. And it worked uh, pretty well. Then I felt more confidence about the real use of this, and I did a, a, most navigator, a map navigation system. So here, 
you have this area of the screen, which happens nothing if you are looking here, but if you look outside uh, this area and focus your eye on, on some point for, let's say, a second, then it drags the map to the center. So you can navigate the map without, without your hands. Uh, here happens more or less the same that in the previous uh, slide. I don't have to be precise about where if the user is looking at here or here or here or here because I'm going to take the whole area and center it in the map. So it's really nice to see how people use this kind of tool and they think they I, I'm a telepathic I can move I can navigate through a map with with my eyes and it works. Of course there are flaws uh, in the model and it does not work uh, for everybody because you know that in Spain we are mostly, we have dark eyes, and if a, people, if a person with blue eyes tries to use it, uh, my model has not uh, learned <laughs> where they're looking at. So it's the bias of the, of the deep models. So lessons I learned from this, from doing this. Uh, for the first models I built uh, were made with TensorFlow, which is good because they let you control every aspect of the execution, and then you can debug it very well. They have TensorBoard, which is awesome. But the problem I had uh, is that I had to create my own uh, abstract data type, which was uh, the model in a, a sticky way. Now they have introduced the estimators, but if you don't use estimators, you are going to live in a sea of uh, variable context, graph context, session context, and so on. This is very bad for prototyping, but it's very good for engineers and for people that want to have a tight control of the, of the tool. Then following the recommendations of my, of my data scientist colleagues, they told me, hey, why don't you try uh, Keras? And then I switched uh, to Keras. Uh, the TensorFlow package, which is in pip, has a tf.country.keras, uh, which is very nice because Keras is like a high-level library over um, TensorFlow, MXNet, and so on, uh, computational frameworks, and let you prototype very fast. They give you a very high level of abstraction in the way that you can define a model, you can add uh, your layers, and then you can perform changes uh, very easily. So it allows you to test a lot of ideas, and as I have said, it's, uh, it has a TensorFlow backend as well as for other uh, computational libraries. I think it's not oriented to, to production, but it is still usable. And you can define uh, your custom operations uh, based on your backend primitives. For example, if you, hand it, you want to define a new loss function, you can do it. There are pre predetermined uh, loss functions in Keras, but you can define your own if you have a, a certain knowledge uh, of TensorFlow or of the backend you are using below. So about the data set, I found out that quality and quantity is what you, 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 you need. So the, the more the data, the best. Uh, if you can get a lot of data, you can also perform data augmentation. So remember to keep the statistical invariances of your data set. And about quality, I think that's, that's a problem. Uh, because uh, in spite that uh, deep learning is used as a universal approximator, uh, sometimes the, the quality of the data is very, is very noise. Uh, so here, you cannot get rid of, of the feature engineering. You know, a lot of people say, hey, fed the model with the image, and you will get a, a good response. No, if you, if, you, if you read the best practices from Google for um, ML projects, uh, they say, if you have any meaningful uh, feature for your model, please feed it into your model. Don't expect the, your deep learning model to, to learn that kind of feature. In that way, you are introducing a prior to the model, but I think it's good to remember. About user experience, uh, when the users started to, 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 to use the the, the, this eye tracking system, uh, at first, they were trying to control the mouse like this, at this distance. Well, the model is not, tried to, is not trained to be used at that distance. So you have to make them know that they have to be in the same position that they played the game, because it's what the model knows. Uh, 
I found out that to be very interesting that the users also uh, would post in the screen uh, to get the, the best positions to use the system without knowing it. So at first they are like this, but after a few minutes they go perfectly centered in the screen without knowing, and then they say, oh, now it works. <laughs> Great, users adapt to the system. Uh, it's also important to remember to manage the expectations about what your model can do or what cannot do. If I go back to here, uh, it's not very accurate to put the cursor over uh, an icon or a specific point in the screen, but you can still use it to perform really cool things. For example, scrolling or dragging a map. And I also want to remember that the model with the best metric could not be the best suitable model to interact with the human. Uh, if you recall the metrics of these models, the CNN has the best uh, validation loss. But when I plugged it into my system, it did not work. Because the only model able to learn uh, a true regression system was the baseline one, the simplest one. Uh, let me say about this. If I'm looking at this point and the mouse and the system says, hey, you are looking here. Okay, that's my reference. Now I'm looking here. If I can move the mouse in the same direction, good, I'm actually performing regression. But if the system says, hey, I move, but now says you are here, that's not a very good regression. I haven't, my model haven't learned anything about the, about the data. So that's why, that's the reason for, for this interaction, just to test. Because for the model, two different images, o sea, two images are completely different. Even if I look into the same point, if there is a minimum difference, uh, the output can be uh, completely different. There is a cascade effect. So if you are in this kind of problems, uh, please try to, to evaluate in some way. You can know it's performing what you want. For example, I get another idea from, from a colleague that told me, hey, don't do a regression system late, I have always done, but split the, the screen in areas and try to predict to the screen with a softmax function, for, exam, for example. So I'm, I'm switching from a regression problem to a classification problem, which is indeed more simple. Well, so to sum it up, uh, a basic data science project, model the problem, spend time modeling the problem. When you have your data, Isolate your test data at the first. If not, you will mix up with augmented data. You will have augmented data in your tests, and you will crash all your system. Define the, your, the metric you want to, to measure your model by. Uh, for example, in this, in this case was an Euclidean distance, which, which, was, which was I trying to minimize. And think on, mini, on meaningful features on your data set. Then create the full pipeline when I mean the full pipeline is uh, from the original image to the, uh, to the extract the features, uh, pass it to your model, uh, uh, get a prediction, and then productivize it. And then you can start playing and optimizing uh, the things, the, the things that, that matters to you. You know that uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil because you can get stuck in some parts of your process. So then, when you have all of this, play, test, compare, and you also need in some, in some uh, experiments, some expert evaluation, because you know we are, in, in this kind of problems where we are always trying to crash the metric. Yesterday I went at the Innovex talk, and Alexander told about how he solved some Kaggle problem. And I know that in Kaggle competitions, uh, models that usually wins are ensembles of, of a lot of models. So when you come to your boss or to the engineers and say, hey, I have this model which performs actually well, and you give them an ensemble of 100 models, they say, we cannot put it into production. <laughs> it, it is meant to be, to be used. Or if you want to do it in your computer, uh, you can do an inference on a single model, but not on an ensemble of, of 100. We don't have the power of computation right now. And uh, remember that if you are in business, not in academia, the real product is what counts. So maybe the metric can be the money you make, how well your users use it, how happy is the people, and not just the, the metric. I think I have 
time enough? Yes. And I have this crazy idea I had to refine a, a data set. Once I had my, my model, I took all my raw samples, I took from, used to train the model, and the, the ones that I got in the, with the game, and then I used the model to rank the samples by the error they produced in the model. I got this histogram, and then I took the samples with the highest error value. It means uh, you have the samples of people looking at the screen, and you have the point, and the model predicts one. So I'm taking the ones that have the more distance, and this is what I found out. <coughs> people that were blinking, these are my colleagues <laughs> from Diva. People with glasses, and the glasses is, uh, are uh, in front of the eye, so they cannot be clearly seen. Smiles, that leads to people with the eyes closed, so I cannot predict where they are looking at in the screen. People that took the game so seriously, they, they, they have very strange <laughs> facial expressions. <laughs> people that look other place, because we were in an enviro in a work environment, so you are working, playing, and you say, hey, hey, and it's, it's a matter of, of milliseconds, but you are looking at other point. A natural person. <laughs> this is the lead data scientist of, of Viva who played wrong on purpose. <laughs> Just to make me not succeed with this, <laughs> with this enterprise. I think the, he, he, he made the top 20 K error images. <laughs> and a man covering his face. But he's actually looking at the, at the good spot. So I think it's time for a Q&A. Do you have any questions? <laughs> yes, it was me three, three months ago. <laughs> <laughs> Without a year with, uh, with, a year with no shaving. <laughs> Uh, thank, thanks so much for your talk, that was really interesting. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, this is maybe a bit mad, but when you were doing the convolutional network, did you ever think about uh, tying the weights to one another for the convolutions of the left eye and the right eye to sort of share information between the two? So, so, sorry. Do, do you see what I mean? As in, as in like, you use the same convolution for the left eye as the right eye, just flipped, just to, sh to reduce the amount so of So you're proposing to concatenate the two images and then pass it to a convolutional. No, no, no. Just, just to have the, the matrices of the convolutions be the, the same parameters With the and, same. and flipped around. So, so like, just the, what, the way you scan the left eye is the same as the way you scan the right eye, just the other way. Uh, the no, I, I haven't tried that, that okay. idea. In fact, there are a lot of ideas, but in my opinion, uh, I think convolutional networks are not going to perform well in this kind of, of problems because they are very, very, very good for detecting things in images, things that are especially correlated. But in this way, I'm not able to model the problem to a regression. The, 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 the problem here is how do you model an image to a regression problem, to, to, to know how an X and Y coordinate. What, what are the meaningful features of an image to say this is X and this is Y? That's why I tried uh, separating things. I also tried all, all other models in which I tried to, 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 to guess uh, by X, by Y, uh, by left eye, by right eye, everything. And the best performing model is the dense one, which less to me, I don't know anything about the problem. Sorry, just one other thing. Did, did you also look at different error functions? Because obviously for you, it's Error functions? Yeah. Uh, yes, I tried a Euclidean distance. Better if we see it. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. I tried the four, four or so. Uh, 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 uh. I tracking models. I think it's this one. Utils, Keras, loss functions. 
Yes. Mini Euclidean. Uh, regularized Mini Euclidean. Mostly I tried the Euclidean distances. I couldn't get other. And there's a funny thing that the model, uh, well, it's not funny. It tries to predict the, the average point. So the dumbest model is always a point in the middle of the screen. And then it's quite conservative and then just move just a little bit. So the problem here is how you make that point not to be so conservative, but to try to approach to the actual point. Because you know, these, these models try to beat the metric, not to do what you want. Mm -hmm. And what you want really is to, to say, I want this point, no bias to the center. Mm -hmm. Yes, I face that, that kind of problems. Thank you for the talk, that was really fascinating. Um, the one thing you touched upon a little bit is how difficult this would be to sort of actually monetize and turn into a, a company. And one thing I was thinking about was um, if you change the camera, of course, that would be completely different. So if we wanted to actually monetize that, I assume you would need to have it on, on a webcam or something that's not gonna move. Um, and that would differ by computer. H how would you address something like that? Uh, when I created the data set, uh, one of the parameters, I think I have it here. I uh, think there's a game anywhere. Uh, sorry, this is the, the old code, the first one I have. Uh, 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 when creating this data set, I think there's a B, 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 B. Ah, right here. Uh, I have something like this to use it in a future. But my company didn't want to monetize it. This is uh, like the excuse to test TensorFlow Keras, uh, how to do gamification. I work in, uh, in research. So we are allowed to have crazy ideas to test new technologies. So this was my crazy idea. <laughs> Luckily, it, it worked pretty well. Thank you for your presentation. I, will, I was guessing more how you label your data set. How I label my data set? Mm -hmm. You said um, yes. the coordinates. Uh, so how many classes you had? I don't have classes for, for I, I took an image. Mm -hmm. uh, can you come here, please? Let's, let's make a, a demo. I'm sorry, I don't have a, a mouse, mm -hmm. but so I'm trying to, okay, try to play. You move the cursor mm -hmm. and then you click. So you wear glasses, choose <coughs> yes or no. Please get center in the screen. No, move, move the computer so you are comfortable because you know you're going to move. Okay. okay, and then put a uh, finger. So, yeah. I mean, move the, you, can, you have to move the cursor and okay, click with and it. Yeah, yes, okay. so it's a game. So now you're going to play. I, sh I follow the cursor, right? Yes. Now so? you have, this is the wind drag. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you click on the target? He's actually playing. He's actually playing. He's actually, well, he's actually playing a game. So when he's clicking the, the targets, I am collecting data through the webcam. So you click and it does not disappear immediately. That forces you to, to keep looking at the screen while I take the, so, the so picture. So you have modeled all the screen is the No, I just took the, the X and Y of the cursor. Yes, but, but for, um, from your model, you had always uh, two response, two labels. I saw yes, it in, it for, for each picture. Each picture, okay. I was wondering uh, if the classes is just the coordinates or the value it's, of the It's not a classification problem, it's a regression model. I'm trying okay, to predict okay. ah, a okay, value. Yeah, okay, okay, For, correct, sorry. That's why I said with a classification problem it would have been easier to solve. I'm happy to contribute for your training set now. <laughs> <laughs> you perform seven hits good. and your total score is 68. It's not good. Ah. <laughs> you have to perform. 2000 or so. In the break, I want to play again. You have to play again. That's what I was saying at the first time. More questions? Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. Probably I didn't understand when you were talking about mirroring, um, that when you were augmenting data set, uh, that you used mirroring, but 
How? Because on the picture which was on the slide, it's like if the guy is looking left and you're mirroring, it means the guy now looks right, which is wrong. So you are not allowed to do mirroring. It's wrong if you can keep the statistics, the invariance of the image. So if I'm looking at the point zero and I mirror the image and my screen is, let's say, 100 pixels, then I have to, I have to put it not zero, I mirror, but 100. So I keep the, st the statistical invariance so I can augment my data. I mean, I'm not sure how exactly the human eye, I mean, are you sure, like, you know, if, if, the, if the picture is exactly mirrored, does it mean now that it will be perfectly mirrored in the coordinates? You know, I'm a little... Imagine yourself, yourself looking at a mirror. Are the both images looking at the same point? Yes. <laughs> so how well, how relevant is the position of the head? And very are, are, you, are you looking at the position of the pupil inside the eye, or uh, the position of the head is quite relevant because um, you know uh, there is a like a normal distribution in the center of the screen of faces. So if you are on a side and you try to move the cursor, it won't probably work. Although first, because I don't have um, uh, training data in that casuistic. And, and then, because although I tried to enrich the system with the position of the head and in the eyes, so it could learn if I have an eye looking at the right, but the head is on the left, he's looking at the center rather than, than, the, than the right. Uh, it's very hard to tackle these kind of problems. So the, the problem is that the model does not always learn what you want. You can guide it through the, the topology of the, net, of the network you define, but it's really, really hard. Um, would it be possible to see um, the demo of the, of, the, of the map, maybe? Maybe later also? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now we have time. So let me see. Uh, OK. Python, Python everywhere. Uh, Python, mouse controller. <clears throat> I don't remember my own parameters. <laughs> okay. Python, mouse controller. I want the behavior to be uh, drag to center and then. Your pen. <coughs> Chromium. Okay. <coughs> it's not going to work perfectly <coughs> because the screen is. Sweet. Oops. The movement of the mouse is made with P auto GUI. First thing? Okay. You have dark eyes. <laughs> yeah. You have to get closer and then try to look at the corners and you can navigate. Can you go, for example, to Japan or let's try. Yeah, he's centering it. You nail it. Nice. <laughs> cool. Yeah. What? How do you zoom? You can't. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Okay, the, so the, the next year I will I will make a facial expression detection and you say hey and you zoom or whatever. You you write one eyebrow on the other and <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so with this very nice demo, let's uh, thank Sam again for his talk. <laughs>